Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Angela McCarthy, and it's indeed my pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of the organising committee. Whoa. We're a bit loud. Can that be adjusted, technical people? We acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and respect these owners across Australia as the original custodians of our land and our waters, their unique ability to care for country and deep spiritual connection to it. We honour elders past, present and emerging whose knowledge and wisdom has and will ensure the continuation of cultures and traditional practices. I'd also will, like to welcome our special guests here this evening, the Chancellor of the, United, of the <laughs> University of Notre Dame, Australia. Oh dear. The Honourable Chris Ellison, welcome. Vice-Chancellor Francis Campbell and our Archdiocese and Vicar General, Father Peter Whiteley. And also our three pres presenters, Geraldine Doog, um, AO and Sister Lucy Kessel, Van Kessel and James McMahon, AM. Where are you? Jane. Oh, he's <laughs> oh but yes, we've lost him. We're going to begin in prayer. Um, and we're in the season of creation, 
and so that will be our focus. Pope Francis instituted the season of creation following the encyclical Laudato Si. Uh, it isn't, in my experience, widely um, presented within parish liturgies, but I think it's an important move. And it's certainly part of the plenary, plenary council's desire to be engaged in the needs of our natural world because Decree 8, Integral Ecology and Conversion for the Sake of Our Common Home, echoes it. So let us pray together. God of all creation, from your communion of love, your word went forth to create the symphony of life that sings your praise. May we who are to till your garden remain in right relationship with all creatures and treasure the opportunity to be custodians of this land. We thank you for our traditional nations who have cared for this land for time immemorial and pray that we may work with them to continue to work rightly on this land. May we be inspired by our history, active in faith present, and look forward to a hope-filled future. We ask this in the name of the one who came to proclaim good news to all creation, Jesus Christ. Amen. So welcome to the University of Notre Dame, Australia. We're grateful for the hospitality of Notre Dame in helping to present the Australian Catholic Church History Symposium for 2022. And some of you were here for the first one last year. So thank you for joining us again. We look forward to being able to explore our rich tradition through the narratives of our Catholic community. The theme for this evening's symposium is professional histories and faith, with three presenters from professional backgrounds that include religious life, the military, and radio and television. Diverse, how wonderful. As we all know, our contemporary lives are entwined in an increasingly secular social milieu, and being open and deliberate about one's faith can be a serious challenge. Each of our presenters are engaged in our world where they have made personal faith contributions within their professional fields. Our recent plenary council, and gratefully there are members here this evening of that council, is an action of our church to reset and enliven the focus of our faith and action in our contemporary world. We have to be more relevant. We pray that we will become a synodal church that's Christ-centred and missionary. And to do that, we can be encouraged by the lives and their stories of those who are with us in our presenters. Following the presentations, there's going to be an opportunity for questions of the presenters. This will be followed by supper in the foyer, so please stay and continue the conversation. In terms of housekeeping, should there be an emergency, God help us if we, we don't want that, but if there should be, you proceed through the doors, out the front door and across to the Esplanade Park. The toilets are in the foyer on your left and we ask you please to turn your mobiles to silent or to turn them off. I now invite our committee member, Oren O'Brien, to introduce our guests. Good evening, everybody, and it's wonderful um, to see so many of you here this evening to support this event. I've got the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Geraldine Duke, um, and it's quite an introduction. Geraldine uh, was, is a presenter of the ABC RN Saturday Extra, which specialises in foreign policy, regional issues, a gender-changing comment uh, commentary, and good books. Uh, previous to that, Geraldine was a reporter for the West Australian, uh, The Australian, uh, 2UE, Channel 10, and was also a presenter and creator of the ABC RN's Life Members and a host of ABC TV's National Wide in the 1980s. Uh, Geraldine's played a central role in ABC television's coverage of the Gulf War in 1991 receiving a United Nations Media Peace Prize and two Penguin Awards. Uh, she's also been awarded a Churchill Fellowship 
uh, for social and cultural reporting in 2000. She's co-author of Tomorrow's Islam, Uniting Old Age Beliefs in a Modern World, which was published in 2005. Uh, in August 2014, her book was released um, by, Tux, uh, by text publishing called The Climb, Conversations with Australian Women in Power. Um, I have Miss Geraldine Doog on all of the information. She's actually Dr. 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 Geraldine Doog. Um, and she's been presented honorary doctor, uh, doctorates from the University of Western Australia, uh, Western Australia, which was her alma mater. Uh, she studied here, Macquarie University, uh, Sydney University and ANU. So sorry, Dr. 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 Geraldine Doog. <laughs> she's an officer of the Order of Australia uh, for Distinguished Service uh, on social issues involving ethics, values, religion, and social change, and was admitted into the Australian Media Hall of Fame in 2018. So I'll now uh, welcome Geraldine to come and present. Well, thank you very much indeed, Audra. And look, when you said this, you know, I thought, oh, no, he's not going to do the full CV, is he? <laughs> um, there's a great line, and I, I hope not too many of you have heard it, of uh, Nicholas Tomlin, who was a very good member of my profession. The only qualities necessary for real success in journalism, he said, a rat-like cunning, a plausible manner, and a little literary ability. <laughs> so that always... We like to think that centres us. I don't, I don't know how true it is, but we like to think it... Well, look, thank you very much indeed and for inviting me to consider this very interesting um, topic. Uh, and it has forced me to reflect. And may I draw on the extraordinary ritual of the Queen's funeral that we have just all witnessed. Um, it has derailed some of the thoughts I had and forced me to consider um, how my religious and spiritual background, if I can put it like this, influenced my reception of it and how, in a way, that affects my professional and editorial judgment. This is a thesis I'm going to put to you because it made me reflect on how much uh, we were imbued with a rich sense of symbolism. Uh, it was a real yield that is not a given these days uh, from the upbringing that I had in the timing of my Catholic faith, and I'm immensely grateful for it. Uh, I think that symbolic um, repertoire introduced me to what ritual offers, which is to see beneath the tangible, to see beneath. I mean, it, that's what I really got from that amazing, amazing ceremony that we've all just witnessed, that to see beneath the obvious human constructs and tools and events to see what is often inchoate and intangible. It's of another realm that isn't, isn't easy to put words to. It, it confers as well a sort of a repertoire, I think, of language to describe uncertainty or to harness it and very confused responses so that you do find yourself well, I think we were encouraged, to, and it's very much the Jesuitical question, what is going on here? What is going on? Not merely the obvious. Now, I think this is really bears consideration, and I want to suggest to you that it has affected me in the way I present myself professionally. And I was listening to The Minefield, which is a sister program of mine on Radio National, um, broadcasting uh, on Sundays, and it was with Waleed Ali and Scott Stephen, and they had a very interesting discussion on Sunday. You can get it on the ABC Listen app. I can repeat these words ad nauseum, but you've he heard them. Um, but they, Waleed in particular, who is a very interesting thinker, a very committed Muslim man, he noted the inarticulacy, was his word, of emotions around her immediate death. Now, this was when she had just died on the Friday morning. And, you know, in a, even though we were all expecting it, it actually was quite sudden in, when it did occur. And he was talking about, and this is before the incredible precision of the funeral, so, the, so it was a completely different time. I mean, we have lived through an amazing week, really, of, of changes. But... Um, he was talking about what he noted 
that there were really contradictions here that were on display if you cared to examine. And of course, I would argue he has been through a very strong symbolic upbringing as well with his strong um, uh, Muslim background. And yet he observed that there, even though it was hard to put words to, and he really struggled, he's an ex immensely uh, fluent man and very um, articulate himself. But he, if you listen, you'll hear it. His words come slowly. He said, look, there was something clearly extremely deep and powerful that people were feeling and needed to display, needed to display, which is, again, an interesting thing. And he felt that it, it proved for him that there was an incomparable expression offered by rituals, the, the need for something beyond politics. He's a very political animal, uh, Waleed, and he accepts that there's a lot of um, uh, ideas, maybe they're too small, and probably a lot of us here would like bigger ones, but a lot is expressed via politics, when in fact what he felt the incredible emphasis of these last 10 days of mourning was that it had nothing to do with overt politics. And he has, he really sort of, um, he felt it was startling and that he wanted to continue to reflect on this. And it also conveyed, though, security. This is what I got. I thought it conveyed an incredible security uh, to the people who took part. I mean, that certainly became the case, of course, as we watched the much more formal morning ceremonies, which is such an antidote to the dis change and disruption of our time. So um, it encouraged me to think again about the about symbolism, which was, a, it really was embedded in our upbringing, that it, it's like a way in, a sort of gateway to the ineffable, that it, it, you know, if I think over time of the sacred heart, I think of the host, I think of the parables um, of the loaves and the fishes, the, the Galilee storm, uh, Peter's three times denial of Christ, the, these are words and, and stories, not just rituals, but they, they're utterly replete with symbolism which we were encouraged to explore. And I know from talking to a lot of people in my world of, um, of journalism that that is simply not something that necessarily flows from often very highly educated people. And they struggle. They struggle with this. And I think you can see it, I can see it, in, in sort of reporting, rather linear reporting, versus people who are very comfortable with going deeper. Now, sometimes, as you know, that gets accompanied by the word mystery. Oh, that's a mystery. And I know that atheist, atheistic people find this so aggravating when they're in the middle of a big argument and trying to actually get beneath the symbolism to, and somebody rebuts them by saying, well, that's a mystery. You know, and I'm comfortable with mystery. Aren't you comfortable with mystery? And they, and they say, well, no, I'm not. I want you to try harder than that. Um, and I do. <laughs> I can see that it can be a fob off. Well, it's a mystery. It's something deep and I don't quite grasp, but that's all right. Grasp it. But that's all, that's all right. Um, but I do feel that the more I think about it and the older I get the more I realised that uh, I was steeped in those entry points to something more than was obvious. And look, it introduced me to other treasures that I really think often contained extremely deep booty. And all of this came to me when I was really looking at and programming for what we've lived through in the past uh, 10 days. Now, there were political overtones in it. I mean, one of the things I was really quite surprised about was that very few people uh, no noted the extraordinary succession rituals that were embodied in all of that. The, the instant the king became the king, the minute the queen died, you know, I thought, I wonder what Vladimir Putin and, you know, Xi Jinping <laughs> think as they're looking at this, what do the, their citizens think? It was extraordinary because we hadn't, I hadn't lived through that before, of course. 
But to just see there was no waiting, you know, while you campaign or you, you sort of do a ballot with uh, all the Conservative members of <laughs> the UK or whatever, it just happened. Now, that, and there were no tanks on the streets, <laughs> etc. There have been, of course, tanks on the streets in virtually in the past in England. To get to this point, very much so. There's been a, an extraordinary, um, you know, the English Civil War being one of it, the, the decision that a, a poorly managed succession is a dreadful thing. It leads to vacuums where demons come in and the most vulnerable suffer when demons enter the picture through vacuums. I fundamentally believe that. I believe it more and more the older I get. And it's one of the... It's, it's a sidebar to the discussion of looking at what's happening in Russia at the moment in Ukraine and you sort of think, I wonder what we'll do if uh, Putin does fall. Could be some very nasty demons enter the picture there. Now, I also think it is interesting how it puts things... Uh, another thing that's made me ponder, and I will sort of allow this to influence my reporting, which is, is that all this pomp and circumstance, uh, it certainly didn't ex exacerbate the stories of the horrors and the, uh, of the British Empire. It, it most definitely emphasised, chose to emphasise the glories. But... Um, Again, that whole idea of the, the, the agony and the ecstasy of achievement and virtue and vice, all of that, I would argue to you, now you can argue with me when, I, when we sit down, maybe you think I'm overdrawing it, but I think we were encouraged to develop uh, an ability to think this through beyond the obvious through the education that we got, so that when you saw something like um, Boris Johnson, that deeply unfit man for office, uh, I wonder what the Queen thought meeting him all those times, give a, a peerless speech in the House of Commons. I don't know how many of you saw it. It was absolutely brilliant speech. And you were left with this sense of, what do we make of this man's character? That he, there was these, the opposites on display that he couldn't harness all of that talent and bring it to bear for the sake of the United Kingdom um, and the, the ironies involved in that. <laughs> I really found myself just pondering that and, um, oh, I don't know, feeling a bit humbled in the face of it, knowing that nothing is simple. So in my own humble life, having a religious sensibility, in my view, has been an unmitigated plus personally, no doubt about it. It grounds me. It is an identity backdrop of simply unparalleled strength. I wouldn't say it's always been professionally helpful, to be perfectly blunt. The early years at the West Australian, when I came out of uh, the University of WA after doing a history degree, taught me very fast about the deep ambivalence inside the media towards any overt faith claims or spiritual claims. It was simply not done. Uh, it had to be a privatised belief system. And you got that rammed into you very fast indeed. Now, I, I might even agree with that in many ways. I'm not at all sure that I want things of a, of a civic nature started with a prayer or that sense that we have to be anything like the United States where almost to prove yourself, um, you, you have to have a facility with words that often I think it is positively rank hypocrisy on display. I don't think I particularly like that. But uh, I can, for instance, for Muslims, when I did my book, this is a real trick. And they can draw conclusions, and the, the, the word is that this is part of what, one of the things that motivated Putin is that strong, he's almost like become a convert again to Russian orthodoxy, and they have persuaded themselves, as has Xi Jinping, that this is a sort of a godless, you know, the world in the West is going to hell in a handbasket with no morals and it's sort of on a downward trend, uh, trajectory that it simply could, can't escape and now's their time. Well, you know, I don't agree. But you can... I thought that is partly because of the relentless secularising just forbids any form of discussion. Well, more or less. Well, I'm going to come to that. It certainly doesn't favour this... Uh, an overt faith, um, a, a claiming, 
which actually caused me a bit of heartache um, because I knew that the journalists involved, it wasn't as if they were incapable of belief, quite the reverse often, often a very sentimentalised, deep, passionate commitment to almost a um, utopian faith, very much so actually. And they, they were capable of marvellous description, like, you know, we've seen just breathtaking writing about what we've all seen. That's their stock in trade uh, when they force themselves to notice. But they do not want to dwell on the conundrums, no. So that all of that sort of what I was trying to display is the, the, con the, the, the uncertainties on display with all that we've seen. I, I'm going to keep thinking about it. No, they don't, want, they don't want to dwell upon that. That's not how they feel they cut their teeth and that's not how they measure people. Although some excellent people have been religion correspondents, Helen Trinker, and my friend who came through um, Brigidine and who went to University of WA and who was managing editor of The Australian until very recently. My own cousin, Edmund Doog, who was religion correspondent at the West and went over to The Age and then went overseas. Peter Frey, who's the current editor of Crikey and absorbed in that incredible <laughs> drama with uh, uh, Lachlan Murdoch. Andrew West on Radio National. So, I mean, it didn't set them back being religion editor. Not at all. And, but I, they have to be good at it. They can't, they have to really throw themselves into it and be very good at their craft in order to get, otherwise I think it can go very badly wrong. Now, where I have seen real um, difficulties with journalism and religion is the inability of a lot of good journalists to even explore, for instance, theology and its impact upon politics. In those really worst days after September the 11th and the rise of ISIS in the Middle East, where we had, I can remember, sort of incredible debates with people about Sunni and Shia, you know, which we were sort of learning to spell, more or less. Um, and I can remember very good uh, discussions with Tony Jones on Late Line. And they, they finally found very good sort of clerics, who were also very good politicians, coming on to talk about what was going to happen next. And I can remember getting to the point where you could see that the cleric was... They were, they'd asked all the basic questions and then the cleric wanted to go into a little bit of theology to explain the differences. And you could, you could see the terror, virtually, on Tony's face. And he just diverted the conversation. And I thought, you know, why are you so frightened to ask a question and to say, tell me what you mean? What, what are you... I, I don't understand. What are you getting at? or, you know, words to that effect. There's a great nervousness, um, even among those who, I believe, began to understand their lack of knowledge and their desire to, to get the headline the next day just hamstrung because of the lack of depth understanding at all. They, they were just like a tabula rasa, to be quite frank. And... Um, and they just didn't know how to go into this area which was so rich. And I think the audience would have been so gratified by. But interestingly, you've got to be careful here. Uh, when I decided I made a decision to take up, um, in 1998, I, to take up the role as presenter of Compass, which meant you nail your flag to the mast, you quite clearly uh, mean you're, you're comfortable with discussions of belief and faith. So in a, in a sense, that makes you in a very, you, you're one of a very, very few who are prepared to do that. I learned, and I got an enormous amount out of it. I stopped doing those big presenting two or three years ago. I do sort of big, you know, about five a year or three a year, big um, sacred space interviews with them. But I found when I was at simultaneously doing Life Matters, which was much more of a sociological program, if I crossed a line, a perceived line, bringing religion into matters of sociology, oh, I got slammed by my audience. They, they did not wish to see. They were very wary and they were watching me. It was no, really no exaggeration. They were watching me. Where is she going to go over the line here? 
you know, she, she, can, she can introduce question marks, but do not bring religion into it, and they'd be very overt about it. So, and yet, I, you know, some of the very best conversations I've had over the years and continue to do so with people who, with a really depth curiosity about matters theological and how it uh, beautifully bleeds into all sorts of other area, areas of life for which one can, I think, provide much better answers than anything else. But um, no, this was something, I've, and I've had to say several times to so executive producers, come and say, oh, you know, would you, do you want to interview so-and-so, so-and-so? I said, no, no, we'll leave that to the religion report. I'll suggest it to them, but not for me. Now, it has been quite interesting to watch the, the rise of podcasting, which is the new sort of kid on the block in audio terms and doing terribly well. And they seem to have much more, there's much more readiness to allow religion and uh, spirituality and theology to enter the picture. And I'm, I find it fascinating. It's a sort of complete antidote to the relentless superficiality of modern life, as I think one Jesuit leader said uh, a little while ago, a few years back. Um, and I, I really urge you to watch just how, where that takes us, because I think it might be a very interesting development. Um, re my reputation. Is my overt interest in religion, has it done me any harm? Well, I don't think it has, but it's possible because I get wonderful feedback. You, know, you get very nice feedback, et cetera, et cetera. But I wonder whether in some of the decision-making circles in the ABC and elsewhere, whether it has done me a little bit of harm, where they say, oh, you know, what's she doing with all of that? I mean, it's very, it can be very blunt uh, in the media. Um, not that anybody has ever said this to me, not as such. <laughs> People have danced around it. And I just got to the point where I didn't think about it. I didn't care what they thought. But, you know, you have to have a years behind you to have the maturity and the poise and the confidence to do that. It got very difficult around the time of the Royal Commission into institutional sexual abuse. Very difficult. And the whole charging of Cardinal Pell and then the exoneration. It's amazing how many people don't somehow want to realise that there's been an exoneration. But anyway, um, I, so that was a very tricky time. So I'm trying to int introduce you to the idea that this is not a stable table in some ways, this climate. Um, look, finally, I'd like to refer quickly to the whole experience of the Plenary Council because I think that really made for very interesting times. And, of course, it's far from over. over. And again, I made a decision, and gosh, I think I'm old enough to do that, but, you know, I thought about it, to put my own money into plenary matters, the, the podcasts I did. Um, I knew the ABC would never cover it adequately anymore, which is an interesting decision in itself, but, you know, I just knew how much was going on, and they did, they tried, but they just, they wouldn't commit that sort of money anymore. Um, what was the surprising to me was the incredible... Uh, response I got from a small section of the population through the podcast, marvellously rewarding, I might add. But, do, you know, I, I don't delude myself. This is not the broadcast area. This is a small section. And to go into that broader area, I'd have to put a lot more effort and money in. I think it can be done, but I think it's very interesting to watch this, watch this space. And if I were the church, I would be plunging money into this space. Um, I'm still fascinated, really, about, oh, I might add, when I wrote the piece in print at the, in The Australian, because I was so annoyed with what Greg Craven had written, <laughs> I, and I got such feedback from going into mainstream media. So again, it reminded me that if, if you can capture something and go into mainstream media, honestly, the yield is incredible. You should have seen very interesting responses I got online to that, really surprising people. I thought, ah, oh, right, OK. Um, so look. My faith has been a big plus in my view on balance, but I'd never blithely advise a young journalist to simply follow their instincts and, you know, go into this and think that it's a, a, a safe zone. Do not preach. Do not preach or be seen to preach that it goes over terribly badly. Be careful of God language. There's a very low reception these days. I think Frank Brennan does a pretty good job, actually of both um, clearly inserting religion into the public square. Of he simply assumes that's where he be it belongs. I, I love that confidence in him. So therefore, he does it well, because he's you know, a very good constitutional lawyer as well. Um, but 
you know, he does that very well. <laughs> That's a, it's a skill. Better to be skilled at both understanding, reading and communications as well as faith when entering this realm. It's not easy. And maybe I'll just leave you with a gorgeous line from none other than Sam Neill, who said, um, in talking about career, always take your talent seriously, never your career. Well, I think I have had a talent for faith, and I think it's helped my career, but I never take it for granted. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Geraldine. That was wonderful. Um, so Geraldine has covered the dimension this evening of somebody working in the secular space and trying to carve out a sacred dimension. We've got a, a nice contrast followed with Sister Lucy, because Sister Lucy is somebody that is very firmly um, in the sacred space and who's gone out into the secular world and brought that faith with her. So I think that'll provide a nice contrast this evening. Um, as way of background to, for Sister Lucy, Sister Lucy was largely educated by the Presentation Sisters, um, attending Iona Presentation College before entering the convent and obtaining degrees in education, arts, speech and drama, and later attaining um, registration as a psychologist. After many years teaching in Catholic schools in the city and rural areas, um, including as principal of Stella Maris, she went on to work for Rua uh, for 20 years. At Rua, Sister Lucy worked with people experiencing serious mental health issues uh, for a number of years before managing the mental health team at Rua and finally facilitating training for new staff. For many years, uh, Sister Lucy was the social justice contact for the presentation uh, congregation. And after 12 years as leader, um, she's about to conclude five years as uh, leader of the Presentation Sisters, and I'm sure she'll tell us what comes next. Thank you, Sister Lucy. Thank you. I would just add a slight correction. It was 12 years as a member of the leadership team, and I've just about completed five years as the congregation leader. What I'm presenting to you will be vastly different this professional history and faith may be different because I'm telling it in five chapters and I'm basically going from childhood to the present. So I was born in Brisbane, first child of an Australian mother and a Dutch father. My brother Dirk was born 20 months later. My father was in the Dutch Merchant Navy and I don't remember him because he sailed away and never returned. After offers of support from friends in WA, Mum moved here and found work as matron of Wansley, at the time a home for children whose parents were sick. We stayed there for five years. Dirk and I were the only permanent children. We were christened at Christchurch Anglican Church and used to go to St Philip's Anglican Church for Sunday school. I loved Bible stories and shouting at the Catholic kids who walked past the gates. <laughs> For the rest, life was pretty tough. At meals, mum sat at a table away from the children. We were not allowed to talk. I did, and ended up regularly in the corner looking at all the pictures on the wall. I used to dream Wansley was on fire and I was trying to escape. My refuge was a hidey hole under the house and the library. Books saved me. Going to North Cottesloe State School was another drama because we were bullied and I had to sing I'm a little Dutch girl in front of the whole school. The whole experience left me with little concept of family, knowing not to trust adults or get caught when I did wrong, like taking mum's chocolate fudge adapting to what I perceived others wanted to receive approval and plenty to deal with in later life. Mum remarried, a Dutch Catholic whom my brother and I detested, and we left Wansley. To us, he was an interloper into our small family unit. 
we moved to Mount Lawley, where an Asian boarder joined the household. My brother and I were conditionally baptised as Catholics and we went to Sacred Heart Highgate. We were afraid of the nuns. One memorable thing about that time was picking a patron saint out of a hat and calling the saint Saint Lucky because I couldn't read properly. <laughs> saint Lucy is my patron saint to this day. We moved to Cottesloe and we went to Star of the Sea with the Presentation Sisters. I loved them from the start. Mother Josephine was so kind to me. The nuns were young and accepted me for the wild tomboy that I was. Father Fay was the local parish priest. He would come into the class and talk to us and then he'd bang his hand down on the desk and the nun would jump and we would laugh in delight. At home, our house was full of boarders from Wales, Indonesia, India, Africa, a farming family in summer, and a boy from Castle Deer, and later Clontarf, who, create, who came once a month and every holiday, my other brother, Kevin, who's actually here today. He's still with me as a mainstay in family life, and his story is something else. Chapter two, Faith Journey. As a child in Cottesloe, with the sister's guidance, I became a holy angel, <laughs> then an aspirant, before finally a child of Mary. I loved Bible history, I loved my guardian angel, and I loved Mary, the mother of Jesus. I loved the nuns and would stay after, stay after school because it was safe and I felt accepted. In 1959, my teacher, Mother Finbar, died in a drowning accident. That had a profound impact. I used to go to church and pray, especially to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Mary meant more to me than Jesus at that time. Through my teenage years, I was pretty much a passive aggressive rebel, wagging school and getting up to all sorts of other mischief and never daring to upset my mum. In year 12, the thought kept on coming to me that there must be more to life than what I'd planned, which was to study and become a nurse and then marry. Maybe God wanted me something else. Maybe God wanted me to be a nun. Then came a long period of arguing with God. You've got the wrong person. I'm not holy. I don't want to do this. It's not, you, it's not right. Then three days, uh, in, eventually, I spoke to a priest during our three-day silent retreat. He asked me, did you have good health? Yes. Do you pray? Yes, and I want to love God as much as I possibly can. Are you reasonably intelligent? Yes, I suppose so. <laughs> well, maybe you've got a vocation. <laughs> At that moment... It was like a weight lifted off my shoulders and I basically said yes. Well, being naive, I went to Sister Carmel and said, I'm going to be a nun. I'm going to enter the convent. No, what do you think or anything else? She was very pleased. Mum was horrified and tried to dissuade me. By the end of the year, I was sick of the whole idea, but I'd made the commitment so I thought to myself, I'll go into the convent, get some humility and leave after six months. <laughs> I'm still trying to get the humility. <laughs> In hindsight, the desire to love God was part of the vocation. Getting away from home was another part of it. God works in mysterious ways. As an idealistic young nun, I wanted to be a saint by the time I was 33, the same age Jesus was when he died. I floated through the novitiate and early religious life, up at 5.40 in the morning, prayer at 6 o'clock, followed by meditation and mass, silence at all meals, school, teaching speech after school, recreation for one hour when you talked and sewed, evening prayer, lesson preparation, night prayers and silence. I kept a diary, disposed of any extra goods I had and tried to love God and be perfect my way. 
without ever really questioning anything. I was very happy. I loved learning and was excited with Vatican II and all the changes, seeing great possibilities and sharing them with Mother General, who had a great knack of listening very nicely then going on and doing precisely what she wanted. I began developing spiritually after a directed retreat with Father John Wallace in 1979. My great devotion was to the Holy Spirit, Mary the Mother of Jesus, and having a sense of gratitude. After going to Marcelin Hall in New Zealand for leadership training, I became aware that I was actually angry for the first time in my life. Professionalism, Chapter 3. After novitiate training in 1964, I went to Claremont Training College, Teachers Training College, completed a teaching certificate and a licentiate in speech and drama. I was sent to Corrigan, then Iona, Carnarvon and back to Iona again. I did a year of spiritual training at the Holy Spirit Institute and later completed a BA at UWA and various Catholic education components. Later, I was sent to Geraldton as a deputy, then principal for three years. Here, I burnt myself out completely. As principal, I tried to be all things to all people, taking on too much responsibility, failing to delegate or use real teamwork. Supervision was not even thought of in those days. It was a lonely, difficult time ending in 1990 with me driving to Perth on weekends for two counselling sessions on the weekend to get me through to the end of the year. I failed to deal with a deputy of whom I was afraid and left a mess for the next principal. That I regret. So in 1991, I had a year of change. It was a breakthrough, not a breakdown. It was a gift and a revelation with serious depression, unable to face people or to be in community, crying for no reason, I faced God and my own reality. Becoming aware, aware of having worn a mask for years in being what I perceived others expected, especially my mother, whom I loved dearly, I went into a black hole of despair. If I stripped the mask away, what would be there? Nothing. And yet I believed God loved me. If God loved me, there must be something lovable and I couldn't see it. I would walk miles and pray, into your hands I commend my spirit, and imagine myself as a small child sitting in God's hand with my legs swinging over the side. I felt completely distanced from the congregation. They must have been utterly confused. Here was I, a potential future leader, totally collapsing. Sister Gabriel, who was the congregation leader at the time, stood by me and told me she felt helpless. That actually helped enormously because it levelled the playing field. The counsellor I visited supported me as I worked through childhood issues. Near the end of the year, she asked me to do a review. Then I realised I'd actually been quite ill. Through it all, God was present, especially in the people who accepted me. It was the first time in my life that I genuinely felt accepted and loved for who I was. In 1992, I started studying psychology for six years while working part-time at the Rua Centre. John and Cheryl, the managers, helped me continue growing enormously professionally accepting me as I was, warts and all. I had become my own person, separate from the identity of being a good presentation sister. With regular supervision, formation and training, I completed study, registered as a psychologist and worked at Rua for over 20 years with people with serious mental illness and loved it, every bit of it. There was constant learning, training and inclusivity in all that we did, including spirituality. Chapter four, justice. We are formed in unexpected ways and often fail to make sense of an event until afterwards. Only later in life did I realize my sense of justice started at Wansley 
when I used to protect my brother from staff who picked on us when mum wasn't around. In New Zealand in 1989, I realised I knew more about Maori culture than I did about Aboriginal culture and determined to correct that. I attended Aboriginal masses at Beachlands in Geraldton and learned more of, of Aboriginal culture. I willingly joined the State Catholic Social Justice Council when asked and stayed when all other members resigned during some, an election period, but I was determined to work for change from within. Appreciating Nana Nagel's charism of service to the poor, I tried to live simply, joined protests, wrote to my members of parliament, spoke to royal commissions, and as the Congregation Justice Contact encouraged sisters to support justice. Sister Bernice Tonkin, Kathy Fagan and I initiated ACRAF, Australian Catholic Religious Against Trafficking in Humans in WA, when encouraged to do so by Sister Anna. Justice, gratitude and hope in the spirit are all one for me. At times it was difficult because the concept of social justice was perceived negatively. Rua, where I worked, did justice. I loved being, doing Nana Nagel's work as a presentation sister, working with the Daughters of Charity in a non-government agency and paid by the government. <laughs> being with people with lived experience of mental illness, writing policies with them, interviewing new workers with them, setting up a client council, all as paid work was a gift, a challenge and exciting. We trained as facilitators in a symposium whose aim was to bring about a spiritually fulfilling, environmentally sustainable, socially just human presence on the planet. We took that to many agencies. We trained the, in Aboriginal cultural awareness and racism and I worked alongside an Aboriginal man inducting new workers. God was in all of this in the workers at Rua, the regular supervision, in the lived values and the challenge to question my own unexamined assumptions and to my racial microaggressions. I joined the Sundowners at Rua, an alternative Christian group which prayed together with clients regularly. We used to lead stations in the park on Good Fridays based on justice issues. I became more aware that we are all one, all created in God's image. In 2013, I had the opportunity, given by Sister Kathleen Laffin, of working at the United Nations for six months as a non-government representative for the International Presentation Association. It was an amazing gift. I used to stand outside the cries of building and look up at it and say, I'm actually in New York and the time is going very quickly. It, and it was a challenge and I came aware of how little I knew about the United Nations. Final chapter, faith. A gentleman I worked with at Brewer told me he had been an engineer, married with children, lovely home and a good job, when family trauma led him to developing serious mental illness with bipolar affective disorder. He lost everything. And yet he could say to me, I'm a better person now, more accepting and less judging of others and thankful for the simple things in life. I echoed that sentiment. My faith is deep and certain I believe I am where God wants me to be. When finding nothing lovable in myself, I was advised to say each morning in front of the mirror, I'm okay, and then fake it until you make it. <laughs> it actually works. I have tried to be of service to our presentation congregation and our church. My appreciation of Nana Nagel has grown largely due to the influence of a teacher at the, the Iona Presentation College who's full of Nana Nagel. As my increasingly deeper, simpler relationship with Jesus and the life he lived has definitely grown. 
When called to lead the congregation, I said yes, because I believed God wanted that and it was the right time. I promised our sisters nothing about you without you, and I've tried to keep to that. Leadership for the congregation has been a gift and a blessing. It has truly been an honour to get to know and serve our sisters in some way, and in some ways I'll miss the special connection with each sister next year when I finished as leader. Today we actually elected the leader for next year and the new leadership team. I believe our church needs to be simple, accepting, respectful and willing to be with others for God. Otherwise, we will continue losing churchgoers. I have no problem with that because we must die to bring forth fruit and often those we lose become models of Jesus for people outside the church and in the world. One special gift has been the plenary council journey where I, like others, listened, prayed, sat with and tried to be open to the spirit. Now is the right time for change in our church. It will come not in spite of us, but because of us. I believe Pope Francis is a gift for our time. He models Jesus' values. Just incidentally, I write a letter to him every year saying thank you and that I'm praying for him, and I have had some replies. Um, I believe Jesus, uh, Pope Francis models Jesus' values, going out to people on the margins, living simply, praying, listening, adapting to the needs of these times, loving the poor. Turning the institutional church must seem like the Titanic trying to avoid the iceberg. Pope Francis goes on, trusting that this is his mission. I know we have a divided church and this is painful. However, I believe and hope in the Holy Spirit, in each one of us and all of creation. Jesus promised, I will not leave you orphaned. So I believe all will be well and all manner of things will be well, as Julian of Norwich says. Just incidentally to finish, following the plenary council, I hope each diocese has a synodal process which is inclusive and truly focuses on living Jesus' values and Jesus' mission, spreading the kingdom of God that we have parishes where the people have a voice in selecting the parish priest or coordinator and accountability is required of all in authority, that we have parish pastoral council formation and assessments, that we continue the discernment process and deep listening together, and most of all, that we be humble people who truly care for one another and show by example the spirit of Jesus truly alive today. Finally, very finally, one count plenary council member at our table said as we finished, he thought of us as being like a rugby scrum, all coming in close together before going out to carry the good news to the world. That is what I hope for, prayer and service. Thank you. Goodness, um, Sister Lucy, I think I'm, I'm waiting for that lump in my throat to sort of subside. That was, um, that was incredible. What a, an insight to um, an amazing life um, and leadership. Um, now, our next speaker, I've, I've witnessed James first presenting at, um, at UWA on the Fathering Project. Um, and he's um, very charismatic, so I think we're in for a treat with our final speaker. Um, James is the Chief Operating Officer at Australian Capital Equity, um, and he's had other roles within that industry, as well as being the Commissioner of Corrective Services in Western Australia. Prior to that, um, James was the Commanding Officer of the SAS, um, and within that, uh, he was in Afghanistan and a number of other conflicts. And for that service, he was given the Distinguished Service Cross, the Distinguished Service Medal, and for leadership and command in action in Timor, Afghanistan, uh, for his leadership in uh, Timor, Afghanistan, and Iraq. 
He was awarded or named West Australian of the Year in 2019 um, for his service to the community. And in 2022, this year, was appointed uh, a member of the Order of Australia in recognition of his services to veterans and their families. Uh, he's been a board member of uh, the West Coast Eagles um, and has been an advisor for um, the RSL in Western Australia since 2017. He's also a member of the board of St John of God Healthcare. Um, he's, there's a number of other roles which I won't go into, um, but uh, his background is also studying uh, within business and defence and administration. So with that said, I will hand over to James. And you can most probably all hear me. Is that is that good? Everyone can hear me. Yeah. A little bit, if that's okay. Just because uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather speak from the heart because I think that that's uh, uh, you know gives you a greater insight into where I want to go. But actually, uh, sister, I'm going to talk about three chapters, not five. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll trim it down to there, which will be the early part of my life. And it's a little bit Geraldine, what you said about that framework. Now, my mother is Gwendoline Clune uh, from the Unorcia background. So I've got to say, she used to say to me very regularly, James, if you haven't got your faith, you haven't got anything. So from day one, it was sort of just accepted that I'd go along this journey. So, uh, but I also think, just as a very macro, I'm very grateful for the journey I've been on. And to be here tonight... What I really found was when I got asked to do this, which to be fair, I was thinking, well, okay, that's, that's fine. But when I really started looking at my life, my faith has actually impacted from right from the start, right through where, my, where I am today. And what tonight, doing the research on myself for tonight, if, if one ever does that in this busy world we're in, it actually taught me that, that wonderful tradition, Catholic tradition of reflection and getting closer to your faith and actually really bringing that, <coughs> that faith to bear. And it took me, it's taken me, I'm 58 now, I know I look younger, but it's 58 now, but I was, it, it actually has taken me, it's just a journey every day. And then I, when I really got down to it, I realised just about every day it impacts in some way. And it's just been a wonderful thing to actually do that, have that time to think about that. And I've written all these wonderful notes, but you know what? <laughs> I can just say it because I know it, because it's about me and where I've been. But tonight, the topic is about my, my professional history and faith. So it's from me. And I think what I want to do with that is say there might be little things along the way where you go, oh, that resonates a bit, that makes an idea, and maybe for some questions after. Because I've got to be open with you, you know, there's questions like, I've been in conflict. I've been in places where my job is taking life. And believe me, I don't take that. That's very serious. That's right to the heart of me. But in saying that, my faith has helped me work through that. And people around me in the faith, the Catholic Church, have helped me work through that. And I'll give you some examples of that. So uh, it was funny when I was looking at the speakers tonight because I said to myself, oh, well, clearly I'm the naughty one. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you always had a bit of a naughty one, right? So, <laughs> so I thought, I'd, I thought I'd, uh, I'd start with that. But let me start about my, the start of my life, which I think was important. And you know my mum... Uh, she's been like the rock. She's still alive. I buried my father earlier this, this uh, year uh, out at St Pat's here. We had the service there and across the road to Camel Clancy's for a few drinks. Boy, it went on for years. <laughs> but I think the thing is, when I started out, there was a couple of key events. So I went to Aquinas College and Geraldine, I really got the framework bit. That really, like I was listening, you know, I was going, that really... Uh, and the fake it to you, make it, well, I'm the king of it, <laughs> right? But that really got me uh, because there was a song I remember very clearly and, and a couple of my classmates, we just had a couple of reunions from Aquinas, 
but they'll know we are Christians by our love. And I know, you know, but that love bit is a really important thing. And if I go all the way to St. John of God's Healthcare, where I've been for five years, the St. John of God's Healthcare did, they interviewed 10 sisters. And it's all on video. And one of the sisters, I'll never forget this, and, and, and there's a really poignant point here. That she, I, I, I'm not sure which sisters. I'm, oh, I think you've asked. I think it was Sister Isabel. I'm not sure, but in a very good Irish accent, she was all these things she had to do in the to look after people. It's just overwhelming and not overly trained to do it. But she says, you know, you know, I, 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 everyone was asking me to do all those things, and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, I said to God, I said, God, what do you want me to do? And all of a sudden she said, well, God told me, just do the most loving thing you can do. And it's, a, it's stuck with me in my whole five years. And that little phrase, I connect with something I want to just say to you that's really stuck with me throughout my journey. I have a saying, and I've said it many times, and I'll take you through some of those times in my chapters. God, be with me now. And that's really resonated with me. And I've shared that journey. God, what is my journey? You look at my career and everyone goes, oh, I have people coming up saying, gee, you've really planned that. <laughs> it's like a piece of paper with a drop. And I, you know, when you open the drop goes all over the place. That's my career. I actually just, at some point along that journey, I just go, what's next? And I leave it as open as that. That's how I currently work for Kerry Stokes. It just felt it was the right thing to do. That's how I worked in corrections. That's how right at the start. Now, what happened at the start? A couple of key moments. One, mum, <coughs> church, framework, Aquinas. Got all that. Pretty take your time. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a five minute call, will you? <laughs> but then something really, uh, and this is important, but it's important to share because we get a lot out of life and it's the real part. It's the, it's the whole... What you do is about being a Catholic, in my view. You know, that's the, what you do every day. And along that journey, in my last couple of years of school, just as the last year of school, is unfortunately I lost my brother. And if I tell you the true story, it was ultimately about drugs. That's the reality. There were a whole lot of other dynamics around that, but that's, that, was, that was the big part of it. And then I watched my mum and dad go like that, with a lot of pressure. But I watched the love and care of a lot of Catholic people, most of the Catholic people around me, giving them framework. They were apart <coughs> for a period of time. Uh, and over time, because mum's just got that, well, that's a sacrament. Back they came together and lived 63 years of happy marriage. Or well, maybe not all happy, but they're <laughs> 63 years. But they very happy through the majority of their life. But... My brother Jared dying was very seminal, and it came back to me later when I talk about uh, St John of God's, uh, sorry, Subiaco Parish. I'll just, I'll, but I'll come back to that in another chapter. So that was important to me, but I watched the community that actually, with that faith, the love and the hope around that period of my life. But what I did is I then went up north. I worked on the roads. Life was confusing like any young man or any young person these days. It's confusing, right? But mum always said, yeah, faith is everything. But she also said, you know, if you need a guide in life, it's the Ten Commandments are pretty good. You know, really simple stuff. But for me, that works. You know, those Ten Commandments were really, really important to me. And, and learning them and understanding them and how to use them, but then actually doing it was important. So that's where, that was that chapter of my life. And I turned up. So this is interesting when you, this art of confession leads into reflection, lead, leads into that whole thinking about things. I ended up at Kapuka in a room full of 30 soldiers. And I realised, I realised then what a privileged upbringing and framework I had been given. I actually had direction. I actually had a set of rules. Now, I call them rules for moments. You know, I know that might be right, but for me, that's how it works. I'm simple like that. 
But the majority of those people in that room, and some of them my best mates and I talk to them regularly, never had any of that. They were almost lost. So I'd lost my brother. My mum and dad had split up. I worked up north. I was still grieving, but I had a phone room. And I think that's faith in action. So then as time went on, uh, by the way, I've got to tell you this about, um, about life, is I went into the Hungry Jacks on William Street to join the military, and they said, look, you'll never be an officer, that's for sure. <laughs> you'll be a soldier most probably, and I think infantry corps is where you're going to end up. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something there, and that, that impacted on me when I became Director General Corrections, which I'll touch on in, the, in my later life. So in the military, let me give you some ideas of that, that whole dimension. The dimension of what I really got, what my faith gave me and continues to give me with real examples. Courage, moral and physical. Conscience. Have I done the right thing today? <laughs> they, are, they are big questions, which I think I'm still answering actually and still seeking thoughts on. Uh, and I think the other one is commitment. So if I go to things like the SAS selection course, 30 days in the middle of the night, there's a lot of times when you're by yourself navigating in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock in the morning, and at some point, you know, I've just fallen down a ravine, my leg's hurting, my arm's hurting, God be with me now. Am I going to get through this? But whatever the plan is, God, just keep me up. And after you haven't eaten for three or four days, I tell you, these things, it comes back to a framework, which I really, I didn't sort of realise until you said that, Geraldine. So, and, and then as I moved forward, then we started doing operations. And I think it's worth touching on Timor and my time in Timor. And there was a time, it was the first time when, uh, and this is very relevant, uh, I was on the operation to get Bishop Bellow out of back out. So we flew in there, and it's the first major operation that SAS were back on since Vietnam. So this is pre going in majorly in 99. It was that period just before where the UN were there, and there was a lot of things happening on the ground. It's the first time in my life I got off that plane and I saw people cowering, physically cowering because of the militia around them with their guns and weapons. And I... You know, I'm just letting you know that. So I'm sitting there, there's eight of us, all these militia, and we're supposed to get Bishop Bellow out and, uh, and other people uh, out of there. At that point, that's the God be with me now point. And for that period of time, I had a run real key moment. I had to walk up to the key protagonists and, and really, I'll be open, create a bluff, so we could get people back onto the aircraft and start moving. That's the, my, my, my job in there was to, to sell the ice cream. <laughs> uh, as I'm walking up, my Sergeant Major, uh, Dallas, I'm walking up and he goes, hey boss, you ever heard of the other one? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Dallas. <laughs> no, I've got to you, cool under pressure. It actually just relieved a bit of the tension, but in my mind I'm going, God, here we are. So for about the next 45 minutes, I had a gun in my head. And that, that really brings life down to us. Hmm, to think about this and how we're going up there and everything's looking good. <laughs> Believe me, I won't go into it in detail, but you could see to give me the strength and courage. I, I, I truly believe that. That's faith. That was me with my faith going, whatever the plan is next, Lord, I'm there. You know, besides the Alamo joke, and I better let them tell us forgot that. <laughs> so that's that's point one. You know, that's that's that side. We got Bishop Bellow out. I never forget coming into Darwin Airport, <laughs> and the uh, the aircraft controller. So C one thirty aircrafts are about. They usually take about sixty people. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, whatever the call sign was. We've got a C one thirty coming into land. Da, da, da. We've got one hundred and forty six people on board, <laughs> and the aircraft controller said, "Please say you're getting up on board." <laughs> so we went way over the limit. We took all the risks, but we got the people out we needed to. So 
you know, including my Bishop Bellow, and that went well. I think the next big time, if I move forward, is when I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Afghanistan. And this is a, a good point, and, and Sister, you made a point about speaking out about your faith, and, and I've been always open about that, and I've found it on a number of occasions it just works for me. Uh, and particularly if I talk about corrections, which I won't go into a lot of detail, but I used to say to a lot of prisoners when I go in their cell, just pray about it. And they go, well, what's prayer? Well, and then I talk them through that. Now, it's their version of prayer, but it's the same thing. So when I got... Uh, I, there's a lot of stories I could tell you about other Timor, Timor times, and, you know, there's, there's Com and all these other ones, but... I think an important one for me is Afghanistan, uh, really, where... So I set up Afghanistan 2. So we've been there early. We did the early one. We went away for a year or two. And then uh, John Howe, uh, through the China Command, we need to go back to Afghanistan and join the fight, I suppose, is the thing. And, and that was important, both from a, doing the right thing on the ground, as much as the alliances that are required which I think today we can realise how important those alliances are. So, so there we go, head off. But when you do force structure, you're only... For us to fly in there with all the air defence and a lot of Stinger missiles and everything else from the Russian days, you've got to be very... We could only take a certain number of people. Now, don't think ill of me, but I didn't take any... We normally take someone from the clergy, but we didn't... I just could not afford, because once we got on the ground... We needed every gun we could, if that makes sense. Because if I didn't do that, I'm not doing my primary role, which is to look after my people and then wider from there. Anyway, I like the way the Catholic Church works because this is secret. This is secret. You know, everyone knows everything. You know, it's pretty, pretty heavy. And anyway, I had, a, uh, I had a person from the church, a very senior person from the church, turn up at the front gates of SAS. And the guard box rings me up and said, oh, boss, we've got another one. <laughs> We've got another one. Because, you know, you get a few <laughs> interesting people at the front gate. He said, I said, who is it? And he said, oh, such and such. I said, oh, please let him in. <laughs> you know, I mean, so he'd, not, he'd known I just used to speak about my faith. So that went through the hierarchy of the Defence Force going, well, James is a Catholic. He's open to me. He talks about it. But we then went through a series of me becoming a special minister and him giving me the Holy Eucharist to carry with me for my men, which I, you know, to this day I just feel blessed. <laughs> um, so as life went on, we got to Afghanistan and every three days we were in a serious fight. So not Timor, not peacekeeping, a serious fight. And after through two months, so I'm there, I'm quite relaxed, I'm walking in valleys, there's sniper fire, there's other things going on. It's the God be with me now point, but I've made that point. And so that gives you a strength, a courage, a moral thing, you know, it really does work out. Uh, but it is no different to a nurse at St John of God's tonight that's got to deal with a grieving family. It's the same courage. Right? So it's not, this is not venerating that it's it's in all parts and i've seen that at st john of god's and you know that's why i love working here but at that point the squadron commander who was who i know very well good old john said to me hey boss uh, and this is this interesting thing about atheists <laughs> hey boss uh, do you think we could get a pre center so i'm thinking well oh, everyone's cool with it you know da, da, da. we couldn't really fly one in so Coming up to Christmas time, we had our services together, um, which was really quite neat. And we had a Canadian troop with us, and he goes, Boy, you Australian SAS have got a whole different way of doing business, and we like it. So, again, this is that, that dimension when it, when, it, when it comes in. I just want to finish off with that last chapter of my life, uh, and, and there's some real relevance there about going into, I went into corporate advisory. Uh, and I'll never forget Neville Owen. There's something I read where Neville Owen, and again, this goes back to that real thing about, you know, uh, you know those whole Ten Commandments. The, strip, the link to Neville Owen is, I remember he wrote in the Australian Institute of Company Directors magazine, 
you know, right at the end of the day, what all corporate governance is about is just do the right thing. And I think there's a strong link to reflection, confession, fess up, fix up, and doing that right thing. So I really have learned that. I learned that in my early days in corporate advisory. And ultimately, they're firms that are sustainable and go forward. And again, that's about being a captain. Uh, there is one story I do want to tell back to Af Afghanistan. I've got to tell this about other religions. So I had a young person from Pakistan from the madrasas who was about to shoot me. And I used local, uh, local uh, Afghan people as my bodyguards when I used to walk around. And he came out of the thing, about to do this. Next thing, <laughs> the Afghan guards about to do what he's going, oh, oh, that's not what we do. That's not what we do. So this is a young man out of Pakistan. So to his mind, I'm the enemy because of actually what I stand for, when it's more than, not just because I'm from Australia, it's wider than that. That's, that's his view. But that wonderful thing, again, to reflect and to understand and to talk to him and literally let him go, knowing that, Hey, we're all in this together, mate. <laughs> Don't worry. And you've made a mistake, but move on. And, you know, he was just eyes... He was streaming with tears when he said, oh, you're not... Like he thought that was it. No, no, no. Please. And that's that. But it was also good for the local people to see that. And again, that's that, that's that courage and that, that doing the right thing. But DG Corrections... Uh, Again, it reminded me uh, of how important uh, faith-based teaching, hope and love are. There's a lot of those people in jail. We know they're there for X reasons and they're, they are there for those reasons. But, but at the end of the day, providing the opportunities for them to use love and hope to get to their next stage in life is really important. And I used to really promote and could see the value of faith of all types visiting corrective services in whatever form and providing that role. And again, I'm conscious of time, so I don't want to go into that. But a couple of other things I would like to say as I've been on my journey uh, with faith and how it's, how it's gone with that. When I did join the West Coast Eagles, someone asked me, Gerald, you spoke about in the media. Someone on the board asked me, you're not a Mick, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and he was a very senior person there, like, he might have been the president. Anyway, we'll leave that there. Anyway, I still got on the board. <laughs> and I, I helped with a lot of that cultural change program and, uh, and those things. Um, but but th that was an important time. Um, but it's interesting if I talk about a little bit, and I can say this about with St John of God's, it has been a privilege and a pleasure to serve in a place like there. And this goes back to, I know we talk about plenary sessions, uh, and there's been a lot of talk about that. I'm not across the detail, but I do like what the two previous speakers have, have alluded to. It is about us as a group of people going forward. No organisation's perfect. What we do next is what counts, right? That's, that's really... And I relate that back to the West Coast Eagles. It's not perfect. It's made mistakes. But it moves forward. Yeah. And there's no organisation in Australia that hasn't made mistakes and is, is moving forward. So I, I throw that out there. But the St John of God's thing that taught me... And I wrote an article for Catholic Health Australia about this relating Anzac Day to what our incredibly devoted staff at St John of God's do. And I mean this about Catholic organisations. Like, I feel like going... I feel like doing the... This is my marketing side. You know, when you come to St John's, St John of God's, you get a bit more. You know, you, you, get this, you get the steak knife as well. But I'm saying that because of the dedication of the staff there. That, that is that living faith, I call it. You know, that living faith that it's more... And it's multidimensional... It's multi-faith-based, faith based. it's diverse organisation, 
but it's what I, it's what, when I look at the ministry, that's us in action. That's parishes in action. That's that actual doing bit. And I suppose my life has been about doing, which is why preparing for this is a good time to reflect. <laughs> so I've tried to give you uh, the essence of my life, how faith has impacted on it. I do want to reiterate, Geraldine, you know, that wonderful thing about framework. And uh, Sister Lucy, I do want to reiterate your point about at, some, at the point with faith, you know, that sort of you're out there on that stage, but you just gotta you just gotta do it at some point and you've gotta you gotta fess up to it. <coughs> I like doing that because for me it creates the conversation, but it all comes from a place of good. It never comes from a place of you're right, you're not right. It comes from a place of good. And my my view as our church goes forward, uh, it provides other organisations do this as well. But other, and, and, and I mean that, other organisations do this as well. But ultimately, in the rich tapestry of humanity, it does provide framework, but it provides hope and it provides love. Thanks for listening. Right, okay, well, we'll begin the, um, the Q&A part of the, um, the evening. We've had some really amazing reflections on people accessing the divine in their careers. And now we get to, um, to prod a little bit further. So would you mind uh, making your way up to the, the seats on my left? Haven't had enough. <laughs> Okay, so questions are open to the floor. Do we have any questions to start off the evening? While you're all thinking about questions, you might like to ask. Um, Geraldine, in our discussion uh, preparing for tonight, you mentioned uh, the importance of leadership going forward in the Catholic Church, and you had some thoughts about that. Um, and how we might form really robust leadership going forward. Would you mind reflecting on that? Yes. Look, uh, one of the... Um, the Life from the Southern Cross document, I think, is just an exemplar of a document um, brought out by the Catholic bishops um, who got a great variety of people, including some of my friends, to draw it up. One of the, I think, 83 recommendations or whatever it is was the need for a, a, a national... Well, hopefully national... Uh, a centre for Christian leadership uh, or Catholic leadership. And I am I really think that this is critical in the wake of the uh, Plenary Council and in the wake of the Royal Commission. And I'm trying to... I mean, it's very, very early days and it's... <laughs> in fact, Audrey and I'm sort of saying more than I ought to, but I, am, I believe that we need something modelled, for me, on the Lowy Institute. I don't know how many of you know the Lowy Institute for... Um, international relations, which was set up by a $30 million bequest from Frank Lowy, the, uh, you know, the um, retail man, to um, set up a centre to discuss foreign affairs and, and our position in the region. And his thesis, and I think this is what's so interesting, his thesis was that up till then, the only people who really knew much about foreign affairs or felt any sort of ability to talk about it were people who had, you know, doctorates in international relations and worked for Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in other words, a very few tiny little group. 
And he's, his view was um, that he wanted a much wider range of people who had maybe an incipient knowledge to be drawn into this conversation and to become more skilled. And I think after 11, I think he's 12 years now, that has been achieved. So I think we've got a much wider range of people skilled enough to, to comment in the newspapers, on television, so on, and foreign affairs. And I think we need far more of them. Now, I think that's what I would like to see happen in the Catholic Church, that we actually have something that is lay-led, but absolutely welcomes. It's not only lay people. And commissions work, acts as a, a, a very much a clearinghouse for visiting people, uh, clearly sends a message to the wider Catholic community, let alone the others, that we're not done yet, and that there's going to be growth intellectual growth um, that contributes to the life of the community. So that's, I'm putting quite a bit of energy into that. I'm trying to think about it and I'm working on it and I won't give you details of what I'm working on, but I am because I think there's a real message of hope to be sent, but it won't be the way necessarily, I mean, it can be sent the way it's already been sent, just as James was talking about, but I think it's got to be more. And I think it's got to perceptibly be classy uh, vigorous, uh, rigorous, and said, say, we're going to be here for the long haul. That's my aim. Right, okay. Um, do we have any questions that have generated in the last? One of the questions, Sister Lucy, that, um, that came to me as you were talking, you've just finished uh, five years in the leadership team of the presentation, Sisters, um, I'm not asking you to map out the next five years, but just some reflections on, on what are the thoughts about the, the presentation sisters going forward in a very general sense. Thank you. Going forward, we're a diminishing group as are so many other religious congregations. And one of the things that we're particularly interested in is a group called the Emerging Futures Collaborative, which looks at assisting congregations when they no longer have leaders within the congregation to, to come to conclusion, basically. So going forward, we, we will have to plan things about our legacy, the charism of nano, how do, we see, how do we seek to continue that after we're gone? In what form is that going, format is that going to come? Who's going to look after that, that type of thing? So it's a case of partly what, what do we want to leave behind us as our legacy? And we're very focused on Nana Nagel, the founders of the Presentation Sisters and her core was re basically to the assist those who were most marginalised in Ireland at the time over 200 years ago. So it's really what would Nana want now? So it's looking to where is the now and how do we continue God's mission in that way for the now with, with the ageing. I mean, the average age in, the, in our, our group is over 80. I'm one of the young ones and I'm not young by a long way compared to him. <laughs> so that's one of the things. And it's also really how do we carry forward the spirituality, the gospel message of who Jesus is and who Jesus was, is today for us and for the world. And education has been a primary centre focus for us and we would see that as still as essential but it's education to those who most need it and who desire it. So it's not to those who are wealthy and well off. It's to those who want a Christian education or Catholic education, but who don't have the finances. So how can we reach out to people like that and give scholarships, that type of thing? Apart from that, there's always, of course, the care of the sisters, which is, is core. That, that has to be there. I hope that's sufficient. I'm going to, we've got a timid crowd here this evening, so I'm going to walk over this way and I'm going to pick on Angela. I'm sure she has a question that she would like to, uh, to ask our three people, um, being involved in the plenary council and some of the deep thinking that went on in there. 
Um, and I'm, I'm going to hand over to you <laughs> at this point. A question. Yes, I could stand up. One of the things that um, James touched upon was he said, I don't know the detail. One of the things that has horrified me is the number of Catholics in Australia who haven't heard of the Plenary Council or have no idea what the impetus is or what it's about or whatever. Um, Lucy was a member with us um, at the Council. Geraldine was there with her eyes and ears wide open and doing a wonderful job. But I'd just like to... Uh, particularly asking Lucy and Geraldine, how do you imagine this going forward? I know you said in leadership, Geraldine, but how do you imagine this going forward with the balance of people um, needing to be informed and needing much more um, input to be able to work with the joy um, and the celebration of the council and the extraordinary spirit of synodality that was within that. Um, look, I think there was, an <coughs> there was an exuberance there that that's not a word we hear, we hear a lot, is it? Was there? Is, is it? Um, and somehow that's got to be transmitted. And I remember one priest said to me, yes, that's the trouble with Vatican II. You had to be there to experience how remarkable. Then it, you know, then it had to be taken forward. Well, it's the same with the council. Look, my instinct is it's got to be through the schools. I've really thought about this quite a lot. And I think that... Um, so, and I don't quite know how. Um, but I feel that there's sort of standard uh, reception channels via schools. They know how to transmit a lot of detail. And I think we might as well, you know, if I were the church, back, back up on that and use those. I mean, obviously you use the parishes. I'm not, it's not as if you don't. But where do you really get bang for your buck, I think probably, is through those very established channels that schools all around the place have. And I mean, I just, I just compared last week the National Catholic Education Commission's, uh, and um, Francis was there, their three-day conference, which was just reminded me of what an, <laughs> uh, a booty is there in the sort of, just the sort of size and scale of that Catholic school system. So I just think we've got to use it. And we've got to get in there and be as smart, you know, and, and clever in the way things are handed on. And there's a lot of work to be done. But I do think that the exuberance I saw and that we experienced, you know, you can't bottle that. I mean, James just, you know, completely talked about the same thing. And so that's what has got to be transmitted. That there's, you know, if I had to cut to the chase, it's like, for me anyway, stop being apologetic, uh, as it were, about... Uh, the, the absence of the church from the public square will be considerable. And I interviewed Paul McClintock, who's the former head of uh, Woolworths, who gave a very good speech. I organised a bunch of sort of small synodality things at my local parish. And he said, you know, that people are going to have to sort of simultaneously be able to describe what the church needs to do. They want to be in church leadership. Uh, describe um, what, uh, the problems, what, where, where the problems are, where it needs to go, and what methods you're going to use in order to bring it. That's what leadership in all manner of... That's what leadership does. Whether, you know, Mark Scott at the head of the Sydney, University of Sydney used to be my leader, or somebody, the, you know, in the military, or somebody uh, at the head of a bank. That's what you do. That's what you do. So we do it in the church. You know, it's not rocket science to that extent. I'm waiting for that to sort of sink in. I'd just add to that... One of, the, one of the keys for, that came up was the importance of formation and formation at all sorts of levels. So it can go to the school, but it can also go to the parish, um, particularly with the, the start now with the synodality and the discernment process and how discernment has really helped and has really led to prayerful consideration of what needs to be done and how things can change. And I think... We've, I mean, those of us who came from Western Australia, we've already had here a meeting with at least, I think it was 60 to 80 people as a follow-up, just talking about 
the impact of the Plenary Council. And that group was very enthusiastic in saying, we've just got to keep pushing ourselves and talking about it and asking for change at our parish levels and keep pushing, keep going. So it's partly that. And, and it's within a framework, mm. the solid framework that we have of the Gospels. Mm. That's what I'd add. Right, I, I, note to self, I better get across the detail. <laughs> but I, uh, look, I, I, I think it's, uh, and I, it's, it's you know, I, 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 as in, again, my heart's full of hope about the church going forward. The reality is, is I, at a very practical level, again, I agree with schools. I do agree with healthcare. I agree with universities. But the message for all of those things, it comes from a point of goodness. It's about what we do. So the schools, the way they help the disadvantaged family. In healthcare, it's going that little bit extra for the family that you mightn't get elsewhere, regardless of race, colour, or whoever you are. So I think all th that's all there. And I think you're right. Uh, I like the fact, but I do like the leadership aspect to that. Um, I was interesting if I could do a little analogy here with defence. I was asked recently to contribute to uh, the review that's going on. And I made the point, you've got government and you've got a defence force. Uh, and it's interesting, there's people in uniform, there's a hierarchical system, so it's sort of an aspect, there is a, a dynamic there of, you know, you could call it clericalism or, you know, an aspect of that. But I did say to both Stephen Smith and Sir Angus Houston, I said, and this goes back to your point, which is, a, I, I think this is where it, what it means, is I suggested that in the minister's office, that they have a, off to one side, a, just a, an advisory board, that's made up of a group of people from diverse backgrounds that can add to the decision-making process. And I think whether we call that leadership or whatever, I think that's good. So at that level, if I could say to you, there's learning and continuous learning, because we all know in school land and hospital land and university land, that's happening now. We're adapting all the time. And I think there's some incredible stories that we don't tell about how well the reach goes out and again, all based on the, that whole thing of Jesus. At some point, it's about, it's hope and love. And whether it's a different religious organisation, the majority are based on hope and love. You know, and I, I'm seeing that more and more. And, and the reality is, we're at this point in the world, the stats are telling us people are moving away from it, but a few uh, geostrategic events in the world, from what I discovered on my time in the military, won't take long for people to get back to <laughs> the finality of life. <laughs> and I'm just saying that because, you know, for Australia, 35 years effectively of gross uh, GDP growth, we're all, and yet we're still unhappy. Like there's some interesting things going on. And I think that Leadership Council could bring those things to the fore in a very polite and learning way. So I hope that's on message anyway, but that's what I think. Ah, back to my normal role. <laughs> um, James, if, if I could pose a question to you, which I certainly would never have posed to you when you were in uniform. Um, and I think it's so personal and so risky, so please feel free to pass it along if you wish to the panel. But I'm just intrigued about a person of faith in uniform navigating the just war and where there is perhaps a difference of opinion between, say, the Pope and the elected government of the day, bearing in mind in a democracy that you broadly follow the elected government of the day. How difficult can that be on a personal level for a person in uniform with a conscience and a faith where there is a divergence? And apologies for the question. No, 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 that's, that's absolutely right. I thought about that. That's a good question. I'll just pass it off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'm not going to do that justice. Uh, but, uh, and I'll just be, from my personal perspective, uh, there is, so uh, it's interesting that I'm thinking about the Pope because I've, that's the bit I'm trying to put in my mind. What do you really mean by that? Is, is, is that, are we getting down to... Uh, the Pope says this and the government says this, or is it? More? Yeah, okay. So, if it if it is if it is that, I mean, I suppose at the end of the day, uh, what I'd have to really do in that regard, and I mean, these are these are really that's a really good question because I'd have to really, really do a deep discernment and and work through that, and I mean, at some point. I mean, what you do next, everyone's got a choice, right? You know, uh, what you do next, in fact, I would argue, what you do next is the only choice you have in life. So, so if, I'm, if, if I discerned that that was more important than that, then I, I got to tell you, I got to go with what I think that discernment process takes me through. The difference, I think, and I'm not trying to be... See, this is the thing. I've learnt so many good things through my journey with faith. The, the, part, the issue I worry about... This is a good diversion. I'll be good in politics. But the issue I worry about is some people don't discern or don't have the ability to discern or aren't given the leadership to discern. And then they do something thinking it's the right thing and it's completely and, – and you know, so that's where it becomes a worry. So I've been given the gift of discernment when I say that. I know the process and I know how to work through it. I've still got to make a choice there. So that's at one level. So that's the, the Pope one. But if I could go down a level, I don't think – and I'm not – at the end of the day when you are committing soldiers – to an action where they ha have got to commit violence and take life, I don't think uh, – uh, you have to say to yourself, is this for the right reason? I don't think I could operate outside of that. And I do think that is framework or what we're calling, whatever we're calling, you know, that uh, – uh, you know, do you learn that in the military? Yeah, you do. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, genuinely back to that faith thing, it, it's right or wrong. And a lot of that, it is based on framework. It's got to be. And how far you go, what's collateral damage. And there's all these rules, I get all that, but they're still right and wrong. And maybe keeping it simple for me makes it easy. I hope that... Um, to end on a positive note, and I think everybody's ready to have some refreshments outside, um, a note of uh, your sense of hope for the future of the church. In a very quick summation, um, we've talked, I think we all realise that there's lots of areas that the church needs to improve, but there's lots of things that it has done incredibly well for its 2,000 year tradition. Um, so signs of hope going forward. Um, just a, a snapshot thought to conclude the night. Just something simple. <laughs> um, well, I... Um, look, one of the things that was interesting was watching the fact that the Queen, for instance, had this extraordinary commitment to her faith, which had clearly been a, an actual tool for her. And I, you know, I introduced that, uh, one of the decisions I made in my sudden coverage, we suddenly had to completely throw out our rundown, I know you want to be quick, and I thought we must have some reference to this uh, incredible drive in her and I had, and, and oh, do we really need that? Yes, I think we really do because I think it's, you know, there were people saying, you know, have we got room for that? Yes, I think we have. And in fact, we had Andrew West on from the um, Religion Report and it was a very good point and I watched a lot of other people pick it up subsequently. So I think it is about con the confidence of seeing what is contributed to the public space. 
and actually starting to, you know, we've been so on the back foot, actually working out what the absence of that would mean to the public square, putting words to it and helping each other understand that so that there's a confidence in it. Now, that's what I'm going to devote a bit of my... That's part of what's driving quite a lot of my thinking. For so long, we've sort of thought, oh, God, you know, we're just hanging on by grim fingernails. And to actually start to see what the absence of, of it is. Um, very interesting work being done in the U US that they're mapping, where a lot of the rise of conspiracy theorists and strong view overlaps very neatly with the decline of faith or faith... Uh, presentation. Vacuums appear in people's lives. Vacuums get filled by demons. I believe that. So that's what I'm working on. Just following on from what Geraldine was saying, something that I heard recently was there is nothing that creates a community more than hate. And and that's, that's the, the vacuum. For me, one of the key um, signs for hope was the recognition of the public juridic persons yeah and on a, on a line with the ACBC, the Catholic Bishops Association and Catholic Religious Australia. So the equalising of those three together is a massive step forward and it's out there and I think that's fantastic. It's tangible, it's real because that's a real recognition of the role of the laity at top levels and that's great. Well, hope a, a range of levels. I gotta, I gotta call this one out because uh, I think the Pope gives us hope. I think uh, washing prisoners' feet, uh, accepting into the Vatican, LGBTQI. I don't know if I said that right. Uh, um, I think these are signs of, and and then there's the, the 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 what I read about the way the Pope thinks about those things is hope. Um, it's 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 about it's a demonstration of learning uh, as we go forward, and then I think there's hope when I look at the plenary session. I don't know the detail; that's true, um, but the fact that we're doing it and working through it, and we're all talking about it, is hope. I also think there's hope in everything I see in our institutions. Uh, I've been blessed to go to a Catholic school. My kids have been to a Catholic school. I'm involved with healthcare in the Catholic uh, tradition. I've watched uh, how uh, that has that how that just benefits so many people. And ultimately, like Jesus did, it's what we do that will really count. And I think. Uh, I think the basis of our framework, <laughs> I have to define that one day, but, you know, it comes from a point of love and hope and it, it will continue on because I do think it is, it's the force of good. So I, I feel very, I actually feel from what I've seen of organisations, you know, we've been through some tough times. Organisations grow out of tough times and the church has been here before, the ministry has been here before. A lot of good organisations have been there before. Good organisations learn and go forward and that's what we're doing. Thank you. I think, um, James, that was a really positive note to end on, the whole notion of Francis of meeting people where they're at and walking with them on that journey. Um, so with that said, uh, I'd just like to invite Monsignor Keating up to present um, some gifts to our guests, to thank them um, for their participation, our speakers, to, <laughs> to thank them for their participation this evening. And our St Mary's Cathedral history.
Right, okay. Well, if we want to continue on for a little while um, with some discussion, we've got some refreshments. Um, and if you want to share uh, the event with other people, we've recorded the live stream and it's available on the Archdiocese uh, YouTube channel. Thank you very much. <laughs>